I want to welcome you to the Nelson Batten Lecture. First thing up for all the students, we have a hashtag. So we're hoping you'll tweet. We're tweeting from the back of the room. But for those who are streaming, they get to get the extra you know, piece here if they also so see uh, you know, tweets going on during the program. So it's a hashtag Cooper UNC. Hashtag Cooper UNC. Um, this is an important night for um, all of us, I think, at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication because this is one of the important lectures that we have the opportunity to share with the students. It's called the Nelson Benton Lecture Series. And Nel Nelson Benton was a Washington correspondent for the fabled CBS News. He was one of the TV correspondents who were built in the Edward R. Murrow tradition who commanded an audience on the fabled Cronkite News. This is when network television was king. People tuned in every night to find out the news. And he was really dedicated to covering Washington and the story of our democracy. And he had a very fluid, easy style about the way he reported. He did it in a way that was very attentive to detail and invited the audience to really learn about what made government and Washington tick. He was a well-respected journalist. He was a gentleman, and he was a Tar Heel. So he um, was very committed to the school, and when he died, many of his friends put together uh, a, a, an estate that could give us this Nelson Benton uh, lecture. And his son has also been committed to the school, so I called him. He's teaching tonight, was not able to come down from Washington, but he said, my dad would have been proud to have a reporter of the likes of Helene Cooper presenting tonight's Nelson Benton lecture. She too, of course, is a Washington journalist, and perhaps at the most important beat in the world, the White House. She works for one of the world's great newspapers, the New York Times. Before that, she was at the Wall Street Journal. And she covers issues as important and complicated as international relations with Iran, the debate over the US debt, and the dynamics around an ebbing war in Afghanistan. And all from the perspective of covering an American president who will go down in history as a breakthrough figure. So what makes a reporter able to cover such a highly charged beat that she's going to talk to us about tonight? Well, if you are Helene Cooper, it is because you grew up in a warm and very loving family with a mother who knew she had high expectations, and you knew it too. It is because your parents and your uncles and your aunts were all part of the leadership of a country and issues were always on the dining room table. It is also because when obstacles arose and the country you love, Liberia, fell into political disarray, you and your family had to flee. And it is because you became an immigrant in the United States and had to start all over again. And it's because you came to a place called UNC and felt the softness of spring and the drive of student body who expect to make a mark on the world. If you are Helene Cooper, this is your story. And you have insight into the world that shapes all your reporting and the drive and the talent to record the first draft of history. And tonight, she's going to share with us an insight into what it means to cover the president. So I hope you'll give a warm UNC welcome to our Nelson Benton lecturer, Helene Cooper, a Tar Heel. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you, Steve King. Um, I can't tell you how cool it is for me to be speaking here at my alma mater. I'm really glad to see uh, classmates from both of my graduating classes here, 1987, Janet Hafer Lamb, and 2010, Paul Latimer. Good to see you guys. Uh, I can't start this lecture about covering the president for the New York Times without talking about the biggest disappointment I've had covering the president for the New York Times. Uh, and it was that I wasn't on the trip that Obama took last November to see Carolina play basketball at the Carrier Classic in San Diego. Uh, he stopped by there uh, to see the basketball game on his way to Asia. And I didn't want to do that Asia trip because it looked like a dog of a trip. And I palmed it off on my uh, colleague, Jackie Combs. And then I found out after that that he was going to go to the Carrier Classic. 
and I tried to get it back, but it was too late. Um, but it was so wasted on Jackie. That's what makes me so angry. She went to Northwestern. I mean, do they even have basketball there? And she spent the entire game, the whole White House press corps uh, on this trip got to go to the game. And she spent the entire game arguing with an editor over some stupid treasury story that she had filed before she flew out there. So she missed the whole thing. Um, and it was completely wasted on her. Uh, this Secret Service agent, who also went to Carolina and was there, uh, asked me after, he was like, how could you miss that? Uh, and I almost started crying. <laughs> I said, and then he told me, he said, it was so great being there, I acted like a complete fool. And I still remember him saying, I acted like a fool. And I was like, I wanted to go and act like a fool too. I haven't been to a Carolina basketball game since like the 80s. Uh, so I did miss that and that was a big disappointment. Um, I've been racking my brains trying to think about what you might want to hear me talk about uh, today. I consulted many people. Uh, should I talk about the state of journalism and how it's changing and this struggle to be first in the competition and still trying to find the right balance and to be correct as well when we're rushing things onto the web? Nah, that felt kind of depressing. Maybe I should thought, talk, I thought, about American national security and the challenge of writing about it for a global audience. No, that would be too dull. Finally, I went to the Oracle at Delphi, Tom Friedman, and I asked him for his advice. I wanted to be relevant and meaningful, I told him, but I'm just a White House reporter. I don't have a global warming cause like you do. What should I talk about? And he laughed at me. He said, come on, for you it's so easy. What is it that everybody who meets you wants to know? And I said, you're right. I'm going to talk about what it's like to fly on Air Force One. <laughs> Seriously, one of the most important jobs of a White House reporter is to put the reader right there, to go beyond writing about politics and policy. You can get that from turning on the TV news or watching CNN or MSNBC, the news of the day. My job is to take you deeper, to also paint a picture for readers of what it's like to be president. What does it taste like? What does it feel like? What is it actually like to fly around in this tricked out plane? That is not always easy to do. The job of the president's advisors, it often feels like, is to give the White House reporters as little real information as possible. They want to show the president as serious, significant, always pondering the major events of the time. They don't believe in color or giving you any kind of detail. They present a picture of him that can't possibly be true because nobody is ever that, accurate, is ever that perfect. The way I see my job is to parse through all of that. It's an ongoing battle. I'm always going back and forth with President Obama's advisors, trying to get a fuller depiction of the president than the one that they would like to present. For instance, the day after they announced that they had caught Osama bin Laden, the Times assigned me and Mark Mazzetti, our CIA reporter, to write the TikTok, and that's journalese for the reconstruct backstory of what happened. And they wanted this story to start, to have this comprehensive arc that would start the day, that afternoon, that the CIA agents first spotted the courier to bin Laden way back in a pickup truck in Peshawar, Pakistan years ago all the way to the moment where President Obama walked out into the East Room to that podium and announced that Navy SEALs had killed bin Laden. And they wanted us to do that in like eight hours. My editor say, uh, said that Mark would handle the CIA part and I would handle the White House part. It was the worst possible division of labor for me because Mark was getting all the cool fun stuff with the Navy SEALs and I was gonna be stuck writing about the boring meetings at the White House. And then to make things worse, the executive editor at the time, Bill Keller, called from New York to say, make sure the story isn't filled with dull, boring meetings at the White House. So I was like, what do you want me, what do you really, what do you want me to do? He asked for juicy details. I had learned that lesson about the value of details the hard way. I grew up in Liberia and my family ran away in 1980 after there was a military coup that overthrew the government. I spent the next 20 years trying to remake myself into something different, separated from what had happened in Liberia. 
uh, what had happened in my past. My father had been shot. My uncle had been executed on the beach by a firing squad. My mom had been raped. We had fled a really horrible time. I spent years after that trying to turn myself into what my idea of an American journalist was, completely separated from that past. Uh, and to become this new American person to shut out what I had uh, gone through uh, as a child. It took me a long time and you can imagine that you know separating yourself from your own history is not psychologically very healthy. Uh, eventually it sort of caught up with me and after 23 years I finally went back to Liberia to deal with you know sort of my past to find the sister that we had left behind who I hadn't seen since we left and to reconcile myself with, with my own history. Uh, and I wrote this book, The House at Sugar Beach. The first draft of my book, I wrote in the first year, and I turned it into my editor. And she gave it back to me and said that it wasn't good enough. She said it wasn't good enough because I didn't have detail. Uh, I had done everything in a very much of just the facts, kind of who, what, when, why, how chronology. Uh, there was very little emotion. The rape chapter I wrote about in one paragraph. She told me I had to go back. She said, people aren't going to care about this unless you first go back and describe the scene. She said, I want to I know what it smelled like. I want to know what it tastes like. I want to know what the air in Liberia felt like. I want to know what was going through your head. She kept after me, draft after draft. And I really resisted that for a long time. It's why it ended up taking me three more years to finish the book. Um, each draft would get a little bit more, but it wasn't until toward the end that I finally was able to plug back into the sort of details that would make the reader care about me as a character, care about what happened to Liberia. It really is the small details that matter. Uh, it's the small details that in so many ways make my own story. I had to do the same thing with this White House story on Osama bin Laden. I had to get the details that would make it relevant to the reader. I went to the White House that morning. The officials at first were awful to talk to. They were just giving you the same hell bent on trying to make Obama look as good as possible. So I would ask them what happened and they say we had a meeting. The president was very resolute. Then we had another meeting. He said it was an American national security prerogative to find Osama bin Laden. Then he ordered the seal, the seal raid. He was very, you know, and it was just, it was like, well, I, I can't go back with this. Uh, so finally I went to the basement of the White House where the National Security Council offices are. Deep in the bowels of the, you know, they don't even have, you can't get cell phone service or anything like that. I'm not sure it's all rigged up. Uh, where I have a source who I use sparingly uh, and he's very hard to get, but when you can get him, he is a wonderfully descriptive senior White House official. And the reason why he's so good is because he wants to be a writer. So he thinks cinematically. He's really great at peeling back the curtain and giving you the kind of stuff that I know I needed for the story. I sat outside his office for two hours. I wouldn't leave. I missed the White House press briefing that they were giving all their official account of the story. And I was downstairs in the basement sitting outside this office saying, you have to talk to me. I'll wait as long as you want. But what they're doing upstairs is not going to help me do the story. I need you. And finally, he let me in. And I got the details that I needed. He told me about how President Obama's advisors, advisors were all completely split. They were all arguing with each other about what to do. He told me about how the Defense Secretary, Bob Gates, really wanted to like go in and drop bunker-busting bo bombs on the Osama bin Laden compound. He thought that doing a SEAL raid would be too risky. You could end up with heavy American casualties. He just thought we should just pound it uh, into the sky. Hillary Clinton, uh, the Secretary of State, wanted to hold off. She was very nervous. She thought that we should consult with the Pakistanis. Uh, let's make sure, because they were never 100% sure that Osama bin Laden was in that compound. And she was urging caution. Leon Panetta, who at the time was the CIA director, was very much pushing the Navy SEAL option. And for him, this was sort of, it wasn't a vendetta, but the CIA has spent 10 years getting a tremendous amount of flack for not having caught bin Laden. And for them, this was finally their chance 
to resurrect their image. And he wanted the seals to go in because he thought that was the best chance of actually knowing what they had got and that they had gotten him. And he was pushing the seal option. So my source was describing these great meetings where they're all sitting around the table in the situation room arguing over what to do. During that week, Washington was a mess. The big story was President Obama's birth certificate. They had, on that Wednesday, they had a big situation room meeting on Osama bin Laden, and then President Obama walked upstairs into the press conference room, the, press, the Brady press briefing room, and released his long form birth certificate to prove that he was actually born in Hawaii. Uh, and then he um, went back, I mean, I remember we were writing stories about the birth certificate. The next day he did another meeting on Osama bin Laden, and then the day after that, uh, that Friday morning, uh, he um, called a couple of his advisors. I remember this morning very well because it was the morning of the royal wedding. And I was very angry that I could not watch the royal wedding because I had to go with Obama to Cape Canaveral to watch the space shuttle uh, lift off. Anyway, before he took the helicopter to Andrews to catch Air Force One, he called four of his advisors to meet him in the dining room. And they thought they were about to have to brief him. They got up all their situation books and everything, thinking they were going to have to brief him again about the Osama bin Laden operation. And he stopped them before they could talk. And he said, it's a go. And then he turned around and walked out and got on the helicopter to fly to Cape Canaveral. So he had made the decision. That Sunday, they were all at the White House again, in the Situation Room, watching a video TV screen with Leon Panetta. You've all seen that picture. and he's. He's dictating to them what's going on in real time because he's getting a live feed from the Navy SEALs. I asked my source, what was the atmosphere around the table like? He said tense. I was like, I need more than that. Uh, what does tense mean? This is a huge operation. How tense? Give me details. And he looked at me for a long time. And then finally he said, Biden was fingering the rosary. I was like, this is the kind of stuff I'm talking about. That was the kind of detail I needed. The fact that these powerful Americans are sitting around the table having just sent Navy SEALs into a house to kill Osama bin Laden, a man responsible for the worst terrorist attack on American soil, who had masterminded all of this. And they were so nervous that as it, that as it turns out, the vice president is fingering the rosary. And it turned out later that Admiral Mike Mullen, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, was also fingering the rosary. So you had two guys sitting around the table like this. They were so nervous and worried. I knew that was the sort of detail that would stand out 200 years later. Now, you've all heard the story about what happened when they got it. the Navy SEALs got into the compound in Pakistan, how the helicopter stalled and they blew it up, how they shot the courier, they shot the courier's wife, then they shot as they're running up the stairs to the house, they shot Osama bin Laden's one of his sons, as they made their way to the third floor where they thought but they did not know for sure that Osama bin Laden was. That part was not my responsibility. That was Mark's. My responsibility was to tell what was happening at the White House while this was happening. They had all gathered around the table with Panetta, the video monitor, narrating, narrating to them in real time. They had ordered all this food from Costco, like turkey wraps and cold shrimp and Diet Coke cans all over the place. My source said it took them 30 minutes before they even realized that, yes, Osama bin Laden was in the house, that they were actually in the right house. I asked him, how did the SEALs tell you that it was actually Osama? How did they identify him? Did they say, we can see Osama? And he looked at me for a long time. I could tell he didn't want to answer. And then finally he says, we had given him a code name. I was like, a code name? What was it? And he said, Geronimo. I was like, are you kidding me? You guys are like nicknaming Osama bin Laden Geronimo? And he said, yes. So the Navy SEALs are in the house talking into the radio to Panetta. Panetta is dictating it back to Obama. And that's how Obama found out that it actually was the right house and they actually had a visual on Osama. Panetta said, we have a visual on Geronimo. And then a few minutes passed. There was utter stillness around the table. And then Panetta said, Geronimo E-K-I-A, enemy killed in action. There was another long silence, and then Obama said, we got him. It took four hours of me sitting in that office, first outside, then inside, begging my source to get the details that I needed to hold up my end of the story. 
But it's so important, I think, in painting the visual of how these people who we elect to be our representatives make these decisions. It's so important, I think, for journalists today to know how important the details are, even something as stray as someone fingering a set of rosary beads. That was probably the most exciting day for me as a White House reporter. But I still haven't told you what flying on Air Force One is like. That was my second most exciting day. After Obama was elected, the first interview that the New York Times got with him was the White House decided going to be on Air Force One. Our office is like right across Lafayette Park from the White House. So you know we could just walk over there and talk to him. But no, they decided that the four White House reporters had to fly to Columbus, Ohio, where he was giving some speech, and then get on the plane and interview him coming back. It was ridiculous. But I was really, really nervous because I had not met the president yet. I never, this was going to be my first time on Air Force One. Since then, I've been on Air Force One like a hundred times, but it's always in the back of the plane where the press reporters sit. This time, because we had an interview with the president, we were in the VIP section, right in the middle. I thought I was going to pee in my pants. Uh, it, the plane is huge. It's got a hospital, it's got a surgery and an operating room in there, it's got all these conference rooms, it's got every cabin has two TV screens, there's a phone next to every seat, it's got the food is like the best airplane food you're ever gonna eat. Um, and all I wanted to do when I got on was just steal stuff that said Air Force One on it. <laughs> So I was in the bathroom looking for Air Force One soaps and stuff when Robert Gibbs, who was then the press secretary, comes in and he's like, the president will see you now if you can remove yourself from the soaps. Um, so like, we go into this conference room and Obama comes in. I was so nervous. And so he walks in and he has this bounce. He's really tall and he's athletic and he walks with a little bit of a bounce. And he's very serious. No chit chat, it's straight to the point. Don't waste my time, let's get to your questions. Uh, so we start our interview and we go around with him. Uh, we were with him for an hour. The plane landed while we were talking to him. Uh, and we still sat around the conference table completing our interview. Finally he got up, it was done, and he looked at me. Uh, and he said, well, Helene, I finished this interview with no more gray hair. I was like, oh, so he actually reads our stories. <laughs> the day before, I had written a story about how it had only been two months that he had been in office and already he had more gray hair. <laughs> and as part of the story, I had gotten this ridiculous idea that I was going to call Clyde Frazier, you know, the, um, the, the basketball player, because he used to do these commercials for this hair color, saying, no play for Mr. Gray. So I was <laughs> trying to get him to give me a quote that he would say something like that to, Mr. to Obama, and I could stick that in the story. So when I talked to Clyde Frazier, of course he wouldn't say it. You know, I'm, the whole interview, I'm like trying to get him to say this one thing. And, but at the end of the interview, he was like, will you tell the president, I guess he thinks like I talk to the president every day, uh, tell the president I want to play basketball with him. And so I thought, oh, I, great, I can just say this since he's brought it up. And that's when I made a fatal mistake. The interview was over. You know that relaxed feeling you get when you're done and it's like, wow, it's finished, it's behind me, kind of done. And he brought up the gray hair story. So I said, hey, dude, Clyde Frazier wants to play basketball with you. And then I just saw my three colleagues just mouse just fall. And I was like, oh my god, I just called the president of the United States, dude. <laughs> and he, you know you really want the ground to open up and swallow you. And I literally did. I mean, if I were white, I would have turned red. Uh, that's a detail that I wish I could forget because the rest of the time, for the rest of my life, Whenever I think about the first time I interviewed uh, President Obama, it's not what he said on Afghanistan or healthcare that I remember. All I remember is I called him dude. Uh, it's been an honor to talk to you today. Uh, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you might have. Probably, but I wasn't going to say who it was. Uh, they can assume, but I also talked to a lot of other people as well. Uh, so on that day, yes, I was sitting outside his office and people were coming in and out and in and out. But I also talked on the phone to other people. I talked to a couple of other uh, officials who were completely useless and didn't give me anything good. Uh, so we're always, you know, you can camouflage a little bit. 
by talking to many people, uh, and then you use what you use. But I also don't think this is a case where this was something that he would necessarily get that much in trouble for talking to us about. I mean, I never named him, but I did use the details in any event. And then everybody, once we did our story and we had all that in there, everybody else followed up on it and picked up on it. And by the end of the week, you know, Jay Carney was talking about it during the briefing. So people would call other reporters who confirm it as well. Yes, ma'am. Ah, that's a hard one. Um, I don't know that there's one thing that I've learned. It's a really hard beat. It's probably the hardest beat I've ever had. Um, it can grind you up because you're, you've got a piece of every issue that's out there because the president has a piece of everything that's out there. So uh, I don't know. I think if I had to do it all over again, I probably would still do it. But I don't think I ever anticipated just how much, you know, how much it would dominate the four years of my life that I was going to be doing it. Fourteen. Yes. I kept a, I would keep di a journal on and off, like it was faddish for me. You know, I was dating a guy who kept a journal, so I kept one too. Um, <laughs> uh, but that didn't, as soon as we broke up, I stopped. <laughs> uh, I read a lot of fiction. I really like fiction. I much prefer reading fiction to nonfiction, so that probably helps a lot. Newspaper journalism is different because it's not easy to get as much detail as you would like into a story. It's, you know, if you've got a narrative type story like that one was supposed to be, you can do it. Uh, but your daily spot stories, you know, that's where you have to really look for a place to stick something in because you have very little space, but if you can slip a detail in, you can get a lot more mileage out of your space, I think. Judy Miller, yeah, that's, um, that's a, a, a spot on the storied New York Times history, as you guys, I'm sure, all know. She was the one who wrote so much about weapons of mass dest destruction before the, in the lead up to the Iraq War. And uh, the Times is still, I think, apologizing for adopting such a credulous tone in a lot of that coverage and not asking the hard questions and just going for it, um, uh, just printing those stories without challenging them. And today, I mean, her legacy is completely felt today. When we look at what we're doing now with the run-up to, not the run-up, because I hope there won't be a war in Iran, but when you look at what's going on with Iran, we're constantly asked now to search and double check and double check and do they actually intend to build a nuclear weapon? Are they really doing what you know, the Israelis are accusing them of doing? And our coverage now is a lot more skeptical and I think that is because of Judy Miller. I don't know the, you know the history of what was going on with her and her sources. She was well known in Washington journalism of having some really high level officials in the Bush administration that she was very close to. Um, but I, you know, I don't know Judy Miller very well. Uh, I was still at the Wall Street Journal when a lot, a lot of this was going on. So I can't really comment on just what her relationship was with her sources. But that's certainly one of the, the things that she's known for. Um, what was your second question? I've already forgotten. Oh, normal day. Uh, it goes and comes. There's an average, you know, probably 10, 11 hours. I mean, I go in I go in late, uh, reporters tend to go in late. So I go in around 10, but I usually don't get off work until about eight. Uh, but then there's some days that you work, you know, I've gone through periods where I've worked every single day for like six weeks straight, including Saturdays and Sundays. And when you're on a trip, uh, an Obama trip, you're really working, particularly the Asia trips, which is why I got out of the last one and missed the Carrier Classic. You're working two days for every day because you wake up over there and you're filing all day and doing whatever he's doing and then it's 11 o'clock at night and you've been up all day since 7 that morning and you're ready to go to bed but your editors in New York are just waking up with their fresh new ideas for how to turn your story around for the next day and so you spend all night doing that and then you keep going because it's the next day. 
Uh, so it can be long. I don't. I mean, it, it, it's it's up and down. After the first year on the beat, 2009, which was a crazy year, it was a crazy because I'd never covered the White House before. But it also was just he was doing everything. I mean. He was trying to do healthcare, he was doing Afghanistan, there was just all this stuff. And I remember I had a week off at the end of the year and I was a vegetable, you know? I didn't leave the couch, I was just completely wrecked. It's hard um, and it takes time because you have to build these relationships, which means you have to put in a lot of time taking people to coffee, taking them out to dinner. Um, I was talking to Speed Hallman, isn't that a great name? Earlier about what I did last night and uh, I was at dinner with these two senior White House officials that I'm trying to coax some stuff for a story I want to do out of them and you know we're out until like 11.15 that night and I was white because I wanted, I knew I had to get up early to fly here in the morning. I didn't, the last thing I felt like doing after a full day of work was to go out and sit with these White House people, but I actually really needed to because this is something that I'm working on. So you spend a lot of time chatting with people and trying to build uh, a relationship where I'm helped by the fact that I work for the New York Times. And this administration, the Bush administration as well, takes the Times seriously. And we, because we cover everything, and we really do cover everything, you know, it helps us a lot. So we're not parachuting in after ignoring stuff for a long time and then trying to catch up. We're like uh, covering stuff in an ongoing manner. And so they take us seriously. They probably return our phone calls sooner than they do other people, but that still doesn't mean that it's easy. You know, there's this image out there that reporters sit around and people call and give them leaks. I wish. You know, I've never gotten a leak before. Uh, it's always been something that I was chasing and trying to get, and you're trying to piece together, and somebody will tell you a little bit, and you go to somebody else. You spend a lot of time bluffing and pretending you know stuff that you don't know, but if, you, if they think you know something, you're more likely to get it out of them if you approach it as a fait accompli. So you have to think about how you approach these people and what you say when you're talking to them. It's much better, easier to get you to 100% if you've got 75 first. So we think we wait a lot before we call the White House, for instance, for comment or confirmation uh, on something. On the night that Osama bin Laden was killed, I was sitting, that Sunday night, I was sitting on my couch and it was the end. We have duty weeks at the um, New York Times. And it was the end of my duty week. Your duty week means that you're the body person following the president around for that week and you're doing everything he's doing, you're doing. Everywhere he goes, you're going. And it's exhausting. And I was right, my duty week was supposed to end at midnight. So I'm sitting on my couch, it's like 8.30 and I get a phone call from somebody who says, uh, the president is gonna make uh, an announcement to the American people at 10. And I was like, oh my God. And so I immediately started, like, you know immediately, he's not gonna just suddenly come out at 10 o'clock about something stupid, so clearly it was something big. And I thought it was Gaddafi, because the, the Libya uh, onslaught was going on right then. I started making phone calls and calling all of my sources trying to find out what it was. I got a great tip from our photographer, Doug Mills, the New York Times White House photographer, because he ran into a Secret Service agent who had let him into the, uh, uh, the West Wing, because he had to be at um, he had to be at the uh, the East Room for when President Obama came to make us. He was going to be taking photos, and he was talking to the agent, but to some other White House officials as well. And one of them told him, because he asked them, "Is it uh, Gaddafi?" And one of them told him, "No, we hear it's Bin Laden." Uh, and he called me, and he said, and I said, "What are you hearing?" And he said, "I'm hearing it's Bin Laden." And I hung up the phone and I was like, oh my God. And so then I really started calling. But because of Doug, because of that tip from Doug, instead of me, and this is what I mean by you can get more of your 75%. Because of that tip from Doug, instead of calling them and saying, what is Obama going to talk about? I was calling people and saying, I hear it's Bin Laden. And after like a dozen phone calls, I finally got a source who was very high up in the government. And I said, I hear, and now by then, he picks up the phone, and I said, I hear we captured bin Laden. And he said, killed, not captured. And then he hung up the phone. I was like, oh my god. And I had written already, I had my laptop on my lap, I had already sent a note out saying, 
to the desk in New York saying, stand by, this could be big. And I'd written two paragraphs before I got the confirmation saying, you know, American forces have captured Osama bin Laden 10 years after the September 11 uh, uh, attacks, um, a senior administration official said. So I changed captured to kill, and I pushed send to send it straight to the web. Uh, and within 15 seconds of pushing send, my phone rang, it was my boss, and he was like, who's your source? And I told him, and he said, okay, we're going with it, we're putting it on the website, are you sure? And I said, yeah. And it, within like a minute, it was up on the Times website. Uh, and then I really went into the sweat, because then you're like, oh, I, it, I better not have screwed this up, because if I had, I'm dead. I'm not even gonna, you know, I have no job, no credibility. Can you imagine miss, missing something like that? Uh, and so that was terrifying. Our website got so much traffic as soon as that went up that it almost crashed. And everybody, you know, and I turn on the TV and people were like, you know, they still had nobody had said yet, what is it, what is it, what is it? You know, and we're sitting out there and I felt for a, a while, we're the only ones, we're just sitting out there and you feel like you're on a tree limb. I literally like in, in a cold sweat. And, um, and then other people started to report the same thing. Within a few minutes, you start hearing similar. And then I start thinking, well, if I go down, I'm taking a lot of people with me. <laughs> but again, this is an example where it's the seven, you gotta get, you, you, have to, you have to know something to be able to find something and to confirm something. And Doug Mills, our photographer, did a fantastic job that night. I haven't, but there are people that do. We've had this issue at the Times, particularly with um, really sensitive stuff involving kidnappings in Afghanistan and Pakistan, for instance, where, uh, or even in Somalia, there's a kidnapping underway now. Uh, there's um, in Afghanistan that we know about and we haven't reported about because the government has asked us not to because they think that will endanger the life of the person. And so there are times where you're really struggling to balance. I have not been in this situation myself, but I've seen my boss and I've seen my colleagues where balance the public's need to know versus, you know, when they, I mean, the White House is always telling us if you print this, it'll endanger national security. 90% of the time we print it anyway. But there are times where you do stop and say, uh, okay, you know, we won't or we'll hold off. And we've held off before on, you know, we held off Jim Risen and Eric Lichblau were the ones who broke the story about the Bush administration NSA spying scandal. They held off on that for a year and a half um, because the Bush administration said that it would endanger national security before they finally went ahead with it. So there, you know, there are times, I don't know if it's, mat it's a matter of wishing I didn't know because I think the first, the whole reason I wanted to be a reporter is so that I could, because I wanted to know. I don't want to not know. I don't like being surprised. I want to know what's going on. Uh, so I don't know if I've ever wished I didn't know something, but I think there are times where, you know, newspapers, thankfully people at much higher pay scale than me have to make those decisions. Um, Washington Week is my favorite TV show to do because they, they don't ask me about stuff I don't know anything about. The biggest fear is, oh God, please don't make me have to spin out some stuff. You know, I'd rather, you know. And so with Washington Week, when I go on there, they call me before and say, we want you to come and talk about Iran. So then I know, and what I do is I actually write down everything beforehand, I type it out, what I think are the important points, what I wanna say that night about Iran. I write it down for myself, and then I read it once, and then I put it away because you can't sit there and read. Uh, and then, and that, you know, the first time I did it, I was terrified, but after, I've, after doing it a few times, you realize that you know a lot, you know, you're not gonna be put in a position to, you know, or ask about something you don't know, you're prepared. And that, that makes it a little bit uh, easier. It's much more difficult, I think, when you're talking in this complete freewheeling type of way about, and you could get a question about almost anything. That's terrifying.
Um, I've been covering the State Department for the Times, uh, following Condi Rice around all over the uh, all over the world, as it turns out. And I love that beat. That's such a fun beat. You get to travel. You're in war zones, but you don't have to stay there too long. You know, three days in Iraq, and then you're out. Um, and it's you're you're doing, but you're able to develop an expertise because it's foreign policy. I was very very happy there, which is probably why they yanked me out because they don't like to see us happy. <laughs> Um, and my boss came up to me, um, is, this was in like October, uh, he, Obama hadn't been elected yet, and he gave me this long song and dance about, you know, we think you'd be great covering him, and you grew up in Liberia, maybe you'll have a different perspective, maybe you can, you know, and I, I you know, it, sounded, it sounded good, even though I had avoided, for years I had avoided the White House, because everybody with any sense knows it's a grind. Um, but I got, it was like I was swept up, historic presidency, all that stuff, and I like fell for it. Oh, I hope I don't sound like I don't think it's a great job. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, I don't know. I think some newspapers will survive. Um, I think the Times will survive. Uh, I think that it's tragic what's happened to a lot of major metropolitan newspapers today. Um, and I think we're only going to see sort of the ramifications later. But this is, you know, when we look at our whole society and you look at these cities like Baltimore, Miami, or, you know, where these newspapers are dying, and these were the places where this, the newspapers are where, they're the ones who kept track of what the school board was doing. What, they kept track of the city council. They were in on the police department. They're checking in every day. And we're losing that all around the country because TV isn't going to be able to pay that kind of attention on a local level. And I think that's, that's really tragic. And my hope is that people at some point will realize that. Obviously, newspapers have to evolve themselves. We're all getting more web friendly. I mean, uh, we, we, we file to the web now, you know, the stories, stories that used to take me, you know, I'd write, a, something would happen, I'd write a story, I'd file it at, you know, 7 p.m. at night. They would edit it and it would run. Now I have to write that story like three times. As soon as it happens, I have to do a quick web version, and then I have to do a more thoughtful web version, and then I have to turn it around and do a version for the paper. And we have to do that. I mean, that's just sort of we're in a very noun type of atmosphere. And I think newspapers that are able to do that and able to figure out a profit model, particularly so that we're not giving away all our content away for free on the web. The New York Times has now started a pay for model, and I'm really hopeful that that will work. But I think that's the, we have to get to a point where we're able to, to turn a profit. The most challenging, the hardest part of my job is having to develop some minimal level of expertise on so many different things. I'm much happier when I can burrow into one deep, one beat and get a level of depth there and like know what's going on and all of that. With the White House job, you've got to, you know, I, it, I'm not a political creature. Politics is not what I'm good at, but I have to write about it. And it takes me twice as long to write a political story as it would take me to write a story about Afghanistan, because I'm much more into foreign policy. So that's hard. When I have to do a, po a political story, I have to do a story, or God forbid, an economic story or a debt ceiling story. Um, I'm in hell. Uh, and it takes a lot longer. And I'm really asking questions like, you know, stupid questions and having to be okay with asking stupid questions. And I think that would segue to my advice to young journalists is like, don't ever be afraid to look as stupid as you want to and ask all the questions. Ask what you don't understand. Make them explain it to you. And if something doesn't make sense, keep asking. Don't, don't feel as if, and this is something that I used to do. I felt like I wanted to appear as if, you know, I never wanted to appear dumb. And so I pretended that I knew stuff that I didn't know. And you can't do that as a reporter. You just got to chuck all of that stuff. And that's something I actually learned here at Carolina and working for the Daily Tar Heel. It's like, don't be afraid to just go in and say, I don't understand this. Explain this to me. Um, and you know, nine times out of 10, you'll come out a lot better off. He was OK. Um, he did, you know, he, he did not say what <laughs> or anything else. 
he sort of smiled. He didn't pick up on the dude thing. He kept talking about basketball. He said, I said, dude, Clyde Frazier wants to you know, play basketball with you. And he said, I wouldn't mind playing basketball with Clyde Frazier. Really? He said that? I mean, he answered me like, you know, meanwhile, Jeff Zeleny and Cheryl Stolberg are staying there going, <laughs> you know. So he, 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 we kept going. He did not say, you just called me dude. <laughs>
don't why you why would you avoid the negativity <laughs> no you just have to parse through it I get I probably get like 2,500 emails a day. Um, of those, probably about 750 are either from Republican operate, operatives or Democratic operatives slinging mud at each other. And I just, that just, I don't even see them anymore. You know, I delete them automatically in my head because this is just partisan stuff and there's no credibility there. And I try to tell that, I mean, when I'm talking to Sources, there's this source of mine who works for, he used to work, he's a Republican, he used to, he was in the Bush administration. He was a great source when he was in the Bush administration because he used to feed me all this stuff about what was going on inside. And then he left after, you know, Bush left, and now he's sort of a Republican operative. And all he does now is sling mud at Obama and everybody else in the thing. And I keep trying to say to him, I can't quote you anymore because you have no credibility anymore. Because every single thing that comes out of his mouth is negative. And so it's not, you know, and so what I look for when I'm writing a story is if I'm looking for somewhere, for instance, if I want to call Obama on something he's done, I think he's being hypocritical, or I think this is whatever, I will look for a Democrat to say that not a Republican. You look for somebody, you know what I mean? You look for, you don't go for the easy crit critic, critique. You go for somebody because it has more substance. It was the same case with the Bush administration. If I was looking for somebody, if I was looking for a critic or somebody to say something about Bush policy, about this or that, I didn't go to the Democrats. I went to former Bush officials because it just comes with more credibility. So you, as a reporter, you learn to try to filter out the noise and try to zero in more carefully on the substantive criticism of which there always will be and there always should be. I think new media puts, I, I think the world we're in now, there's a lot of information that's out there. Uh, it can be hard to distinguish between chatter and actual real information. Uh, there's a lot more stuff out there, so it's a lot easier to get background on stuff, but you also have to check what source your information is coming from. I have ones that I trust and ones that I don't. So you gotta be careful. You know, you read tweets, and I'm on Twitter, and I'm reading a lot of this stuff that's out there, but you also need to learn to stop filter it and take a step back. Just because something is on the internet doesn't mean that it's true. Uh, and that can be a challenge. You just learn to, you know, you've got to learn to separate just, everybody has an opinion, everybody has something to say out there. And you've just got to learn how to sort of plow through all of that. Um, I think it's harder, but it also it also makes things a little bit easier. You know, there's never there's almost nothing now that you end up having to do a story about that there won't be something about out there on the internet. You can just Google, you know, and find out a little bit of background, and that helps you again. That gets back again to what I was saying about you know going into any kind of interview with a little bit, you know, knowing a little bit more, and that it helps you to figure out what questions to ask and just what doesn't sound right to you. That there's nothing that would surprise Americans. He is exactly the way he seems. He is, and I, I say that without irony, he's very, he's very comfortable in his own skin. He, he, there's no question I've asked him that he has never, has not been prepared to answer. He knows his stuff. He actually reads the briefing books, but he does more than reading the briefing books in that he reads. He's a voracious reader. Uh, he's, uh, and so he's usually really well prepared. You can't, you know, it's really hard. I've never been able to catch him, you know, flat footed. Um, and usually it's easy to catch a politician flat-footed, but with him it's more difficult. He's really controlled. He doesn't really trust the press. I don't think he really likes us either. Um, so when he's with us, you know, even when he's off the record on the back of the plane and we're chatting, he's, um, he's still pretty controlled and he'll joke around and do all of that, but he's never, you're never going to catch him saying something that the White House will later come back and try to walk back. 
You know, when he's, if he says, like you see with Romney, and he's always saying something, and then they're like, no, he didn't really mean that. I don't get that at the White House very much from something that Obama has said. You don't, they don't come, you don't get them coming to, well, what he actually meant was this. You don't get a lot of that. So it's sort of, you know, I would say he's really, really controlled. And I don't know how, you know, it's hard to imagine how anybody can be that controlled. I don't know if it's necessarily a good thing or, or a bad thing, but that's just the way he is. Um, it's hard, and at first, sort of, when I started covering the White House, I already had a really good depth of source. I had a good number of sources on foreign policy. That was not where I had a problem. My problem was the political people. I didn't know them at all. And that has taken years. And I'm still not, you know, I'm not where, like, our other White House reporters who are much, the one who is much more political than I am, I haven't caught up to her on the political side yet. It takes time. It takes effort, it takes slow, you know, you write one thing, but you know what gets, it, it's, it's very interesting, the thing they get, it's writing stories that gets it. Because the more they see you in the paper, the more they sort of get in their head that you're somebody of consequence and to return your phone call when you call them. It also takes, you know, you gotta bash them around a little bit. You can't be nice. You know, you make them, you should, you should be, not, con I don't know, it's, anybody can be confrontational in the press conference. That's the easiest thing in the world. It's not about going and saying, oh, Mr. President, isn't this true or isn't that true? But the point is to actually write about stuff that they don't want you writing about or find out things that they're not ready for you to know about. And once you start doing that, they start taking you seriously and they start paying attention to you. And that, uh, uh, that, that helps a lot as well. And then there's, you know, if you write something they don't like and they call and scream at you, that actually helps because nine times out of ten, those conversations, you end up getting more information. And you can use it against them later. I think they have a very legitimate complaint, and I make that mistake as well. I did a story three weeks ago about the Republican candidates and Iran and what their positions were. And, um, I had Romney and uh, uh, Santorum and Gingrich in there, and I, I forgot about Paul. And I got all these emails after, and I was like, you're absolutely right. I should not. Have. I mean, it's so easy to, but the guy is there, and he's like, you know, because he's number four, you know, and he's not, you know, winning the, the delegates that the other three are winning, is really easy to, you know, to dismiss him. And I think we do that at our own peril. I wish I hadn't done that, and I'm sorry, you know, in the next time. I'll try to make sure to remember him. You guys keep asking me. I think I'm, I'm starting to get worried that y'all don't think I'm working hard enough. <laughs> um, yeah, we have a good backstop at the Times. Uh, the paper is great because we've got people all over the world. And I walk into that bureau every day and I look around me and We've got Eric Schmidt, who's like one of the most awesome intel reporters ever. We have good Pentagon reporters, great CIA reporters. On the national security part, we're really, you know, I think the Washington Bureau of the Times is at its best. And we backstop each other. You know, if we talk about the stories with each other that we're doing, and if I hear somebody is doing a story that even I have nothing to do with, but you know, I'll, if I know something about it, I'll go and tell them, or I heard this. Eric is great at that. He'll hear you doing something, and out of the blue, it'll be 10 o'clock at night, you'll get an email with, from him that just said, I just had dinner with these two CIA guys, and they said this, 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 and this on you know that story you're working on, so just FYI, so that you know where the CIA is coming from. And we do that with each other all of the time. We do a lot of stories together as well. And those are probably the better stories because you get a fuller reporting. You don't get as much time to get your whole narrative voice in there when it's like two or three of you on a story. But it's much rounder and it's a much fuller picture. You know, I have good sources at the White House and the State Department, but I don't have a lot of good Pentagon sources. So when I'm doing, you know, I often work with the Pentagon reporters and that, that's a good backstop. I work very hard, <laughs> hours and hours and hours a day. <laughs> I, I think on that we have okay. to take a break. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I'm also going to give a plug for her book. 
It's a house on Sugar Beach. I was telling her, I bought not one copy, but two. I gave one to my daughter and one to my best friend. It's a fantastic book. And I think, you know, you learn what she learned in the process of writing. The best part about being a reporter is you're always learning. But for the students, there were three things if you heard them. You gotta be a strategist. You're not just a recorder of what someone said. You're a strategist about what to ask next and having that. You have to build relationships. So you have to think about what it is you're giving, and that's always interesting. And never worry about looking dumb. Push those questions so the country deserves to have you push the questions they'd like to ask. Aren't we proud of this Tar Heel? Well, thank you.